Can solid rock bend? Well, the answer is both yes and no. Given really, really high pressures and high temperatures, solid rock can indeed bend. When a rock is bent and it recovers its original shape, we say that the bending is elastic. Think about a rubber band, pull on it and it stretches, but it always bounces back. But if you pull it too far, it's going to break. When this occurs to solid rock, we say that the rock has reached its elastic limit. When rocks are buried deep within the earth, they experience high pressures and temperatures, allowing the rocks to undergo something called ductile deformation. This kind of bending is permanent because the rock, even though it's hot, has reached its elastic limit and will not return to its original shape. Rocks at or near the Earth's surface will not experience ductile deformation, and that's because these hardened rocks are well above the confining pressures and temperatures that are required to cause extreme bending and folding. When these kinds of rocks exceed the elastic limit, they fracture, and we say that the rocks exhibit brittle deformation. Now, before we move on, we need to define a few terms here stress and strain. Stress refers to the force applied to the rock per unit area. Strain is a measure of how much the shape or volume of the rock has changed. These two variables can be graphed to explain both brittle and ductile deformation. If a rock is under high pressure and only experiences stress without any strain, the stress would be graphed as a vertical line. That's because it hasn't changed shape. Notice in this graph, the line now has a slope. This means that the rock is experiencing both stress and strain. This sharp downward trend means that the rock fractured because it reached its elastic limit. Remember, when a rock behaves this way, we say it has experienced brittle deformation. In this graph, the rock also reaches its elastic limit, but notice the curvature of the line. This means that the rock is permanently deforming in a ductile fashion. Stress can be applied to the rock in one of three ways. The rock can experience compressive stress where applied forces are pushing in on themselves. The rock can experience tensional or tensile stress where the forces are pulling away from each other or the rock can also experience something called shear stress. Shear stress occurs when two parts of a material slide past each other upon application of forces parallel to the plane of movement. Now that's a mouthful but I think a simple analogy will help. This stack of cards is experiencing shear stress as forces are applied to move in a parallel fashion, causing the material, 52 cards in this scenario, to experience the strain of sliding past each other. Okay, so let's see how well you did. What kind of deformation do we call this? And what about this? Now, if you said a brittle deformation for the first example, you'd be correct. Good job. And if you said ductile deformation for the second, you would be correct again. So you're doing really, really good. Okay, can you remember how to define geologic stress and strain? Pause the video if you need a few minutes. So if you said that stress is a measure of the force applied per rock unit area, you'd be correct. And what about strain? So if you said that it's a measure of how much the shape or the volume of the rock has changed, you would also be correct. Again, good job. Now, what kind of stress is this? And what about this? And last of all, what about this? The correct answers are shear stress, tensile stress, and compressive stress in that order. Okay, it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. Did you know that some rocks have experienced ductile deformation while being close to the surface? These sandstones in the Grand Canyon, for example, have deformed by as much as 90 degrees. 
The problem from a secular perspective is that this bending supposedly occurred more than 400 million years after the rocks were first deposited. But the sandstones should have turned into solid rock after only a few thousand years or perhaps as many as 10,000 years. It is impossible for terrestrial sandstones such as this to stay wet and pliable for 400 million years. Some might object and suggest that these rocks were exposed to high pressures and temperatures during that time. But when rocks are exposed to high pressures and temperatures, the grains in the rocks are heavily altered. This is called metamorphism, and this alteration is easily detectable. Yet these sandstones show no sign of metamorphism whatsoever. Now it is possible, given strain that works incrementally at the microscopic level, for bends like this to form over large time frames. Think of the rock compressed, but not heated, bending at just millimeters per decade or something like that. But evidence for this type of strain would be evident in the rock itself in the form of microscopic reorientations of individual grains. Yet these kinds of reorientations are absent from these rocks. And are we really to believe that strain tirelessly bends these rocks at the microscopic scale over tens of millions of years without any meter scale slippage. The Grand Canyon area has experienced five large 5.0 or larger earthquakes in just the last hundred years. Great big earthquakes like this cause massive fractures in the rocks. So how many 5.0 or larger earthquakes did the Grand Canyon area get in the last say 70 million years? That's when upward movement of these rocks supposedly began. Well, if you get five in a hundred years, that makes 3,500,000 earthquakes greater than a 5.0 on the Richter scale since uplift began. Does this bend look like it has experienced 3,500,000 large earthquakes to you? The simplest explanation is that these rocks were not rocks when they were deformed, but rather they were wet sediment. But that would mean that there were only years to millennia that separated the time of deposition from the time of uplift. Yet notice that from a secular perspective, more than 400 million years supposedly exist between these two events. These data, however, do not conflict with a young age creationist worldview that believes all these sediments are less than about 10,000 years old. Okay, so that is all from me here, Dr. C at Creation Geology for Beginners. Now, for other resources, don't forget to go to my website, www.creationunfolding.com. I have a book as well if you want to look for that. Uh, if you thought this video was helpful, then it would be incredibly supportive if you could hit the like button and subscribe, and of course, ring the bell as well. But you know what? I think the greatest support that you could possibly provide me would be prayer. So if you could stop right now and pray, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.